Hi there, this is Chris Porter, and thanks for tuning into this channel. If it's your first time here, I interview people that have ADHD, as well as interviewing other coaches that help people like me that have ADHD. And um, so wanted to bring you this interview with uh, Matt DePorter. We covered a whole bunch of different topics, like uh, when he first discovered that he had ADHD, um, some of the, the things that he's found effective for helping him to manage um, kind of this way of thinking and the way that his brain works. Um, we talked about one of my favorite um, metaphors, which is that ADHD is like having maybe nearsighted or farsighted eyes and that we can uh, find glasses or even kind of create our own glasses for managing um, you know, the, the way that our brain works and that what works for me may not work for other people. So we get into that some, and uh, it, for me, it's just always fun to get to chat with other people that um, are similar, but also have some differences in how their brains work. And so, um, yeah, it, it was great to get to uh, chat with Matt and uh, hope you enjoy this uh, wide ranging conversation. Cheers. All right, Matt. Well, thanks for joining me. Uh, I'm excited to get into this and uh, chat with uh, another awesome person that has ADHD. Uh, I know I have it and I've been um, chatting with other people to just learn about their experiences, the world. What is ADHD like for them? Um, and so uh, you were gracious enough to say yes and uh, jump on here. So why don't you just share, like, who are you? <laughs> yeah, Th thanks for having me. Um, well, my name is Matt McPorter, and um, I am just a guy that's interested in too many things. So it, uh, my ADD turns out it spans across all of my life areas. So I tend to get into everything in a good and bad way. So my wife is very patient. <laughs> so that's uh, <laughs> kind of who I am. But yeah, I, I work in industry and I do something called a job called site reliability engineering, which is basically um, programming in automation for basically cloud computing and IT automation. So I write code that automates infrastructure, uh, but I also have a software development background and went to school for computer science. So um, school is not easy for me. It was exceptionally difficult. I didn't do well in most of school and it, it really, my ability to handle my ADD came much later in life. Um, it came during my college years and I started learning about myself and kind of working through that. Um, I think a lot of that started probably around seventh grade or so that I really started getting a handle on it. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So speaking of your, your ADHD and learning about it, like when did you first either know and identify in yourself that you had it or maybe if you got, um, professionally diagnosed with it yeah so my parents would always uh call me the kid that talked too much i mean that's probably where it started and i always just had this interest in everything and you know my parents had a really hard time keeping me focused on stuff i was just kind of all over the map so um i very early on my parents were drywall contractors so they would go to people's houses uh, they were self-employed and they would just set me up in the middle of the room in like a little pack and play. And um, I would always interact with a bunch of different people. So what's funny is that I always call my parents by their first names. I never called them by mom and dad because they were always engaging with customers and they would refer to them by their first names. So I grew up knowing them by their first names. So it, it kind of developed the people skill aspect really early on because um, I was always in a professional setting um, but not in a conventional way. I mean, professional as in like customer relations and being around a lot of different people from an early age. So my social skills built pretty quickly, but um, where it first became apparent is when I was about five years old in kindergarten. Um, what I've learned about education is so few people actually understand what it's like to have ADD or how to teach or adapt to it. And um, this teacher in particular, my kindergarten teacher was exceptionally bad at it. And um, she had this ideology that girls and boys learn the same way. So that already was destined for failure. But um, what happened is when I was about five or six years old in kindergarten, um, she recognized that I had some trouble with attention. 
So she sent me to special ed to get kind of diagnosed and they did just kind of like a soft evaluation and they're like, oh, oh yeah, he has ADD. It's pretty obvious. So <laughs> um, very promptly, they wanted to get me on Ritalin. Um, they want to just put me in a drug induced coma. And my parents, thankfully, were wise enough to be like, mm, yeah, we're not going to do that. So that's mm -hmm. that's when I first found out. Yeah, so that, that hits on a topic that I, I've both been medicated and not medicated. Um, and I think for some people, it, it is a really great solution and it can be, um, but for others, it's not. And I think um, the research that I've come across is that there are a lot of people that can be successful without medication. Um, and for some people, you know, that that's the route that they take and they become successful with medication. Um, so it all and comes I know, down to like self-discipline or your ability to control yourself a little bit. I mean, I think a lot of that has to do with how we're raised. If you have mm. parents that are willing to let you explore and let you be a little crazy, um, I, I volunteer for youth ministry and um, the, the youth pastor has this really interesting way of dealing with people. He says, um, kids go around in their lives all the time being told what to do and what not to do. And when, as a youth pastor, uh, he has a lot of difficulty trying to rein people in. So what often happens is he'll, um, he, he actually encourages them to go be crazy and do fun stuff. He actually eggs them on like, yeah, go get him, go get him. But then that what that does is that actually allows him to rein them in. It like gives him permission to rein them back in. And I think hmm. when you have parents that are, allow you to be a little bit crazy, it, it, it gives you that space to kind of work through some of that stuff. So I think a lot of it has to do with upbringing and how patient your parents are. Mm -hmm. And parents didn't like it and they really struggled with it, but they knew that taking extra time was worth it to not medicate. So I think that's a big component of how I think I was able to, to deal with it. But there was a lot of other ways that it just, it wasn't good. I mean, I needed more help than I actually got, so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I tend to agree. I mean, there's been people that I've met over the years, especially kids that um, are just uncontrollable. I mean, even as like a, like one time I was at a, um, a summer camp as a counselor and there's this one kid that I was like, oh, okay. He actually needs his Redolin. Cause when I first <laughs> met him, I was like, oh, he's going to be fine without it. So I just did a little test on my own to see what it would look like and i was like oh no he he needs it <laughs> okay yeah. so it, it, mileage varies as you say well and lately for me um I, I started drinking coffee when i was 12 and 13 years old and i think so i self-medicated using caffeine which really helped me um right. but now that i'm uh, i think it was around age 40 the caffeine wasn't helping and actually was just causing anxiety and anxiousness and irritability and it was just keeping me up at night and I, it wasn't even helping me with my uh, symptoms. And so just recently I, I you know, got prescribed Ritalin and, and got diagnosed again. Um, and, um, and so, you know, because I couldn't be using caffeine anymore, that's when I, I started using the, um, the medication and it's been really helpful. Although I'd really miss coffee and caffeine and, and how that helped me. Um, but I know the last time we talked, not recorded, you were sharing some some really cool things that that, that you've been doing that have helped you to really um, kind of find your focus and flow. If you don't mind, like, what are some of those things that that you have kind of implemented in your life to take control of ADHD or to to find focus despite the way that that our brains work? Yeah, no, it's it's a great question because it's you know. I think really what comes down to dealing with any form of disability or any challenge that we face, like being self-aware and being be willing to admit that you have a problem is so critical. So that's really kind of where I'd like to start is that really you need to admit to yourself that you're not like everybody else. You have to find a way to be okay with that. That, you know, that it's not a bad thing. I mean, you, you we, have a way of doing things that's way different than everybody else. And growing up in society, it, it's it's normal to want to comply with how thing how things are done. And you know, we all have idols. We all have people that we look up to. 
And we want to be those people sometimes. And when we can't, um, sometimes we, we chase after that so much so that we'll use that as our baseline. And when we start to fail, um, we just double down on it. Like, oh no, no, it's gonna be fine. It's gonna work. And, and that's just not the way it is. I mean, with any disability, you have to say, no, wait, hold on. This is not the way I operate. This is not how it works for me. I'm gonna slow down, figure out what's going on with me and try things until something starts to work. So um, as an example, like, let's say uh, I, I also have dyslexia, so that definitely doesn't help things. So ADD and dyslexia is, means that I can read a lot of words and not comprehend anything. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so for me, the way it would show up predominantly is that I would um, in school, I'd be reading some textbook. They'd say, oh, go read chapter whatever. So I'd start reading chapter whatever. And what would happen is uh, my brain would pick up on a word and I would just go off into Never Never Land and just start thinking about all these other things. And then I, you know, what's interesting though is my eyes are still tracing through the lines. So I'll be two, three pages later and go, oh yeah, I don't remember anything because I'm playing this story in my head. Um, but but that's the type of self-awareness that I'm talking about is recognizing that you're losing attention and going, whoa, hold on, stop. I need to go back to where I understood where I left off and start again. And it's frustrating because it's one of those things where you're gonna have to do it over and over again. And that's kind of what I had to do initially to overcome because reading comprehension was one of the worst things for me. If someone were to tell me something or explain it to me, I would get it super quick. But if I had to read it and comprehend it myself, it was it was almost impossible mm. to do it. So that's where I say that for me, what helped is to, to be self-aware of when you're losing that focus. So when you're losing focus, stop, take a deep breath, and then slow down and just try it again. And if you see mm. yourself doing it again, where you're like, oh, I lost attention again, maybe even two words after where you were, it, you know what, just do it again. You're just gonna have to. And, and you'll build over time, that will become a habit a new habit where you can actually work through those types of issues. Mm. Um, I'm curious just to think about like, what is life like for you with ADHD? Like, how might you describe that to somebody? Like, you know, what's different about you than, than maybe someone that's normal? Well, I think the easiest way to put that is that um, storytelling is not sequential at all. I've found that most of us that fall into this category We'll start telling a story sequentially, and it'll be A, B, and then Z, X, Y, and then M, and then Q, and then A, B, C, because we forget where we left off. And then all of a mm -hmm. sudden, we're just playing alphabet suit, and we can't remember where we are. Mm -hmm. And then it's that epiphany of, oh, yeah, that's what I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think the, the biggest thing that happened to me and what it's like is that I need forgiveness. I really need to ask people to be like, okay, wait, like I can be a little crazy sometimes. My storytelling can be a little weird. And, you know, as people get to know me, if I start seeing them be fatigued by my storytelling or if I see them like glaze over, it, it's really important to engage. Eye contact was so hard for me as a kid. I would never make eye contact. And I mean, even now I'm struggling to do it and where I'm at, I mean, I'm averting my eyes. That's another big <laughs> pattern, but um, I learned that it's okay to avert attention, but it's important to look back at your person, your subject that you're looking at, because it's really important to pay attention to what they're doing. And if you don't have that feedback loop, you'll, you'll just go off out in your own little world and, and you'll lose them. So it's important to kind of bring all the, these things back. So that mm. that's a lot of the times how it works. Um, so not in linear storytelling, the the advice uh, a little bit ago was was slowing it down. And um, I kind of heard like, you know, giving yourself permission to make mistakes or to yeah, like yeah. giving yourself grace was kind of a, a theme that I heard uh, you talking about. Um, are it's there the any finish, not perfect? Um, yeah, sorry to interrupt. I mean, no. there's there's a concept. There's a video that I spoke to you about before called finish not perfect. 
-hmm. And that honestly has been such a game changer for me. And I use it as a tool to help people when they're frustrated with their lack of progress. Because in this world, I mean, things are really tough in the sense that there are very small margins of error that you're allowed to have. And um, that's why I like this concept. It, it was basically an artist that um, was very bad at drawing and wanted to become a comic book artist. So he would always try to draw perfection, never achieve it, and then just give up and be like, oh my gosh, I'm never gonna be an artist. So he took it slow, did it one step at a time, and just realized that completing something was more important than trying to make it perfect. So mm. that's the idea of finish not perfect. So okay. I, I also consider that same concept with failure, that sometimes we won't allow ourselves to fail. And that lack of failure and the lack of being comfortable with failure is what prevents us from growing. Because like in my job, I fail all the time. I literally fail thousands of times a day. It's actually normal for me to fail. I'll write some code, I'll execute it. And it's like, nope, didn't do what I expected to do. It's a syntax error or whatever. But, you know, I would say that that's a lot of what life actually is, is that we try to do something. We think it's going to work. It doesn't. So what do you do? Are you going to get crushed and just mm. fall apart? Or are you going to say, okay, wait, I made a mistake. It's okay. I'm going to get comfortable with failure and work through those issues as they come. So I think for me that really becoming comfortable with failure, admitting that I have a problem and not letting it control me, letting not letting my limitation limit me, but using it as a strength and just being comfortable with people around you. I mean, talk to your friends and family, be like, hey, look, you know, I'm recognizing that I'm not okay and mm -hmm. that the way I operate is different and I need you to hold me accountable. If I'm mm. doing crazy stuff, help me to learn what it looks like through your eyes so I can begin to understand what I look like from the outside. And that will teach me how to adapt how people see me. Um, mm. And that really helps to engage with, like I was talking about earlier about eye contact and, and getting that feedback loop of data that we so desperately need as you're growing and working through stuff. You know, at where my mind was going as you were talking about failure and, and accepting it and being okay with it is that, I, let's see, if the these juggling balls that I have back here, um, I've been, I learned how to juggle when I was like 12 and then I can now do maybe five a little bit, but not for a really long time. So I can do four oh, consistently. Hey, that's, that's good. And I can kind of do five. Um, and, and I bring that up because it, it, when I was juggling, it, it's not like, oh, I dropped the ball. Okay. I need to just stop. I should just give up now and never do it. Now that I've taught a whole bunch of people how to juggle, my goal is often actually teaching them, okay, you're going to toss the ball and just not even catch it, let it drop and just notice where it goes and use that to start error correcting. And, and so the goal isn't how many tosses can I do without dropping it? I feel like that's often the goal that people have when they first start learning. And instead it's how can I make this toss accurate or how can I do that and, and break down those steps and to kind of incorporate what we make. would say a failure yeah. into that process of like, how can I fail? A little bit better or how can i fail but maybe you know if you're programming like how can i get a different error this time instead of the yeah. same error you know we, we, or it's funny how you can be <laughs> excited about another error message that's uh -huh. not it's, it's uh -huh. really weird but you know it's it's funny because the juggling analogy actually translates really well into what it's like for us because with add we are so uh, we're, we we lose focus so quickly we get so many things up in the air. It's kind of like having a lot of balls up in the air. And mm -hmm. where we fail with ADD is that we won't drop them. And our fatigue with the amount of balls that are in the air gets so high that we get crushed. So mm -hmm. your, your idea of letting a ball drop is actually a good coping mechanism to start thinking about how to start adapting to our, our situation, our ADD. Because mm -hmm. ADHD, I mean, we're, we're squirrel, 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 squirrel. There's all these different things. <laughs> If we can pull that back in and say, okay, wait, let me just focus on two balls or three balls. Like, let me get a grab or get, let me handle the balls that are in the air in the way that I can handle them. And then I can add more balls later. And then as you get to be an expert at dealing with those things, 
that's that's huge. I mean, I, I think it's a great analogy for what we experience. So everybody should go learn how to juggle, right? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> but I mean, you know, I, I think counseling is really important as well. I mean, mm. there's been a lot of things that have been challenging in my personal life. I mean, just every, everything from my wife's medical disabilities and um, different challenges that we've had in our marriage and in life. I mean, everybody's got it. But um, my counselor was always would always tell me, he says, you know, Matt, you're really fighting a, a, a war of many fronts and you're fighting a ton of battles and you're losing them all and they're taking mm. you over. So mm. you need to give up on the battles that you just can't win right now and fight the ones that you can. Mm. Because the thing is, it is a fight. I mean, we have to fight this every day. I mean, people think, I, I think a lot of people when they're first learning how to deal with ADHD, they come to people like us and they go, yeah, but I'm never going to be like you. I can never be like you because you're so good at dealing with it. But what people forget is that they're looking at the finished product. They're looking mm. at where we are now. And that's the, that's the harm of even seeing it that way is that we aren't finished beings. We are always learning and growing from our mistakes. I mean, like you said, at 40, you had to reevaluate and figure out what was going on. So I think a lot of people, when they first come across somebody with a disability like ADHD and they see a high functioning person, they go, oh, well, I, I just can't. There's no way I'll ever get there. But that's mm -hmm. where I think it's important for us to talk about stuff like this, where we say, no, I struggle every day and I'm utilizing the tools that I built for myself every day as coping mechanisms. And there's days mm -hmm. where I can do that exceptionally well. There's days that I really fail at it. And that's where grace comes in. And we need to learn to give ourselves grace whenever we do fail. And that's why I talked about the idea of um, being okay with failure. Because you need to be okay with yourself, uh, with failing, and just being forgiving of yourself. I mean, we can't mm -hmm. forgive others if we can't forgive ourselves. I like what, what you were saying, um, that we have to keep using the, the tools that we've made our, ourselves um, and keep applying them to our lives. Um, and the, the image that I had uh, as you were sharing that is of like an auto optometrist, you know, adjusting those yeah. lenses, you know, it, where they've got that big thing up in your face and it, like, is this better or this better? Oh, what about this? Is this about better One, or this two. better? One, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and that, um, you know, for us, we've found things that work well, just like maybe putting on glasses. Um, and so you found these things that work well for you. And my goal in, in all of these videos is to to share kind of what is it like to go into the, the, the ADHD autometrist and make adjustments, knowing that, that what works for you may not work for somebody else, right? And so um, I think as I've been talking to more people, realizing that Yes, there are some things that have worked really well for me that, that are, you know, there are some common things in, in our stories. Yeah, exactly. And then there's also some differences. You know, I can't just hand, my left eye is not as bad as my right. You know, I can't just hand these, take them off, hand them to you and, and they would work for you. But what we can do is to look at how does, how does the eye work? How do glasses work? And I think the really hard thing is for someone with ADHD that you have to almost learn how to build and make your own glasses and then yeah. learn on a, oh, sorry, my, my video went out. And then, so you have to learn how to build your own glasses and then you have to learn how to keep adjusting them. You know, every year go back in and uh, is this still working for me? Does this serve me? Oh, you just like well, the coffee. Adjusting Does this serve me or no? The coffee doesn't serve me anymore. I need to change it. Right. I mean, adjusting is so key because it's one of those things that like sometimes things will work for a while and then they stop working. I mean, mm -hmm. I've had to change so much about myself in every job that I take. I mean, working in the tech industry, anywhere from 70 to 90 percent of my job changes. Technology, mm. tools, languages, uh, methodologies. And it, it's such a high change environment that it gets very fatiguing. And there are things that used to work great for me in the past that don't work anymore. I mean, mm -hmm. as I gain in complexity of understanding and just being better at my job, um, there are things that I have to give up in, in lieu of things that work better for me in that circumstance. So I like mm -hmm. your statement of being able to adjust things over time because there will come a point where things that always worked before don't work anymore. And I think that's why self-awareness is just so important. 
to be aware of what's going on with you. And when you start to see that things don't work anymore, like change it, swap it out with something mm -hmm. else. Like don't get hung up on something that works. Like it failed, move on, not a big deal. So yeah. Well, I, and that's where um, I think if you struggle with self-awareness, that's where I think coaching can can be helpful. And so I'm, I'm working with two people um, to build those skills of self-awareness. But if you, if you're not good at building those glasses, you know, or haven't either stumbled on a solution or haven't figured that out yourself, I think um, at the very least talking to other people that have ADHD and learning about what are the, the things that have worked for them, you know, and then maybe another level beyond that would be talking with an ADHD coach like me or like others that are out there about, you know, what are the strategies that kind of what are the whole realm of lenses for glasses that are out there? And hey, try on this lens, try on this one. What about a monocular, you know, a monocle or, right. you know, whatever. Have you thought about trying contact lenses? Oh, your eyes get straight. You know, no, that won't work. Okay. Um, but I think, I think that's why it's important to know that we're not alone in this. Mm -hmm. I think that's why it's so important for humans to be bonded with other humans because God created us not to be alone. God created us to be a community of beings. I mean, God wasn't happy that Adam was alone, so he created Eve. I mean, he we need that engagement. We need that collaboration. We need communication. And mm -hmm. I think the advantage of knowing that you're a lot alone, you're not alone, is that you're seen. Being seen is so important to anyone on this planet. We are living beings that have souls and very great complexity that that makes us who we are and there's ways to use those things to celebrate how other people do things but I, I think the key is with anything any challenge that you're facing that being alone is scary it's not good mm -hmm. for us to be alone so being able to engage and find others even just hearing their story even if it's so polar opposite of what you are sometimes hearing someone's tribulation the difficulty that they go through and how they've overcome it, just that alone can teach you, hey, you know what? I can beat this. I can make this happen. Mm. That's, yes, amen. <laughs> I agree with all of those things. So that's great. <laughs> uh, we've covered all the things that I wanted to hit on. Anything else you want to share or even if it's like, yeah, we, we talked about a few of the components of, of what your glasses look like for, for helping your ADHD. Was there anything else that you wanted to share that, that we haven't covered yet? Yeah, I, I think another thing that happens to a lot of people with ADHD is that they have insomnia. I think a lot of us struggle to quiet the mind is really one of our biggest challenges. And um, something stuck with me. I, I was listening to a story about um, Albert Einstein's life and how he operated. And, you know, a lot of people talk about he would fail in school and, you know, but later on just went to such successes. But um, something that, that has worked exceptionally well for me that I think is so important for, for us is that what he would do is when on his nightstand, he would keep a little tiny notebook. And whenever his brain was just going crazy and just shooting all over the place and solving literally the problems of the galaxy, um, he would, uh, whenever he felt himself just not being able to find comfort, um, he would just dump everything into a notebook. And I've found that that is so critical. Being able to just mind dump and brain dump into something, whatever it is, a notebook, a note-taking mm -hmm. app on a computer, mm -hmm. whatever. Because the thing is, is that I like to refer to it as noise. That sometimes when we get too many juggling balls in the air, it's just too noisy and we cannot handle the inputs and data that are happening. So by doing a brain dump, it's, it's a really healthy exercise to get it down on paper. But one of the biggest things that a lot of people struggle with is organization that in our situation. So, um, you know, every time I talk to somebody, that's usually the first thing that I identify is that they aren't organized. They can't organize their thoughts. They can't keep an organized set of tasks and they're just defeated by that. So the action of brain dumping and getting it down on the paper is not only clears the mind of noise, but it allows us to observe it from the outside and say, okay, wait, all this stuff is my head. Now I can actually start organizing it, turn it into bullet points, reorganize it. I mean, the reason I'm a huge advocate for doing this on a computer is that 
um, in our ADD minds, like scratching and scribbling and crossing out and erasing just makes it worse. So I've always found that like opening up a Google Doc or just any notepad that does bullets and just dump and then reorganize and plumb everything into where it needs to be can really help you to start the process of organizing things. Because we all live different lives. We do things differently. But I think finding a way to collapse noise into reason and action is just so critical. Mm. Collapsing noise into reason and action. I like that. That's cool. <laughs> I, I have, yeah. uh, I have uh, the, the notebooks like this that I yeah. keep with me uh, on occasion. And, but I, I like that suggestion of keeping it by the nightstand because I definitely have struggled with that from time to time. So this was an awesome conversation. Thanks so much for uh, yeah, making the time to chat, me. Matt. And um, yeah, looking forward to uh, to just having more of these conversations with people like you and uh, potentially if we wanted to, to do a follow-up sometime, uh, it'd be great sure. to, to chat again. So yeah, thanks for joining. Yeah, sounds great. Thank you very much.